Good morning and welcome to another morning show with the Artist Forge. It's morning as you can tell. I'm very tired. <laughs> My name is Nicole York. I'm going to be your host today and joining me as always are your wonderful and talented co-hosts Matt Stegliano, Becca Bjorki, Kat Ford Coates and Basam Seba. Good morning everybody. How is everybody this morning? It's morning. It's morning. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like we've all had a week. Ooh. Um, yeah. Yeah. That'd be accurate. <laughs> an accurate statement. Um, how's everybody doing this morning? If you're hanging out in the audience today, good morning. Let us know how you are and let us know if you're here so we can say hi. Oh, no. I've got repetitive stress injury. Uh, so I'm. Um, I'm basically numb from my shoulder to my fingertips. There's like nothing going on here. So um, it's mainly from wrist to fingers. And in my WebMD non-medical opinion, I've got something wrong with me. So uh, yeah, I'm trying this out to see if I can alleviate some of the wrist tension tendonitis stuff. I don't know. Did you go to the doctor's net? What's that? Did you go to the doctor? No. The doctor is like two and a half hours away. No. I'm going to fight you. Okay. So I'll win because you have a repetitive stress injury and my arms are still healthy. Now I've got like <laughs> splints and iron. I can just kind of block. <laughs> oh. I need band braces. Make me a leather man brace and I'll just wear them like You need a the elves medieval. for that, man. Yeah. Okay. Well, there you go. That's, that's how my week's going. Oh Ow. man, I'm so <laughs> Christine is with us, or Crystal, I'm sorry, as well, is with us this morning. Good morning, Crystal. I hope you're doing wonderfully. I'm so glad that you're with us. Thanks for saying hi. If you guys are in the audience, don't forget to say hi this morning. Becca, how are you? Tell us about uh, tell us about the live streams with Adobe, Miss Fancy Pants. Fancy Pants. Um, I will say I was not wearing fancy pants. I was definitely wearing pajamas uh, <laughs> that no one could see. Um, yeah, they're pretty fun. Uh, it was definitely a new experience to stream that way. Like I've done like some kind of really casual live streaming like with you guys or just like, you know, on my own. Um, but uh, having like a really big audience like that was definitely new, <laughs> um, especially for a lot of people like who I don't already have a kind of relationship with. So it was definitely interesting to have that kind of exposure and have that kind of conversation uh, during the process uh, was definitely really cool. Um, and I'm pretty, pretty stoked on the art itself. Uh, the first day I made this big environment, um, which was mostly finished by the end of the short two hour stream. So that was pretty awesome to bring that together really fast. Uh, second day I went in like real casual. Uh, this was kind of a I don't want to call it an experiment because I knew what I was doing, but it was just like, let's just like go with the flow and like actually do this in a more natural way and it's still like it was pretty cool just to go through that kind of like character creation process on the second day instead of environment and uh see where it led so it was fun it was a lot of fun for sure yeah yeah i love that so if people did not get a chance to see and watch and learn from you where can they go now if they want to watch um, well, I can give you my address. You can drive to my house and watch me through my window or, um, <laughs> <Don't you> can... <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, uh, there's a replay up on a uh, YouTube, uh, either on the Adobe live YouTube or the, um, Adobe creative club. Nice. And, and what do they, they just look for your name? Yep. Cool. All right. So, um, Basam, how about you? How was your week? That pretty much explains it, I'm guessing. <laughs> I guess so. Yes. There's. He's pointing to say to go to Cat. Yep. <laughs> how? How? Okay. Well, let's do that then. Cat, how are you? <laughs> oh, I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. Uh, we're changing up some tech at the studio, so last night and tonight or tonight it's not even not even there yet uh so i'm working on like peer-to-peer -peer transitions and hard drive backups and all of the things uh yeah uh but this week has been relatively quiet um outside of like you know back-end stuff 
Um, but yeah. It's Friday. It's Friday. <laughs> Thank God. All right. Well, now that we know that we've we've all had a week. So um congratulations to Becca and and um yeah, we're just gonna move on from here. <laughs> Uh, and say good morning, everybody. And we're so glad that you're with us this morning. I can see that we've got friends hanging out in Facebook world and all over the place. So say hi if you're here so we can know who we're talking to and, uh, and post you a little bit so we can get some great uh, comments from you guys. All right. Can you hear so, me now? Oh, there we go. Okay. I just switched microphones to the camera microphone. So hopefully you can hear me. We can. All right. All right, so to go ahead and, uh, and get into things this morning, obviously. Um, yay, we've got friends joining us. Hi from Facebook land, and also Lindsay is here. Good morning, Lindsay. Um, we've been talking about visual literacy. That's what this whole thing has been about for the last few weeks, and we have gone over all of the external influences when we are trying to understand a piece of art and now we are talking about the internal language of the art itself what the artist chooses to include in the image and how they choose to include it and then how we as the viewers should read those things or can read those things we talked about subject already and we mostly talked about how we tell what the subject is or what the subject matter is so when we look at a piece based on what's included in the frame how do we distinguish what the subject matter is and who the subject is of the image? But there's more to discuss when it comes to just the subject itself or themselves. Um, in when it's a person, there are a whole lot of new things that are introduced, such as um, posing and costuming and body language and facial expression and all of these things. Not only that the subject is doing, but then how they are related to their environment. So how does that environment, which we discussed before, also give us context clues to who this person is, what we should be thinking about them. And we have a few images to look at this morning with interesting subject matter where we're gonna look at the subject and see what we can distinguish just by what the artist has chosen to include in the frame and how they have chosen to pose and help that subject frame their facial expressions as well and see how visually, <laughs> okay, I like that cat sticking its booty right in your face right right live it's great that's just the perfect explanation for who cats are right like <laughs> what did I do <laughs> <laughs> that would have been a whole different stream <laughs> like um, you all tiktok that's going around right now <laughs> sorry I haven't even I don't even know look at look at this I'm so tired I, I can't even anyway so we're gonna look at those and then we're gonna break them down together and so we'll get feedback from y'all when you see these we're, we're gonna go with that um same context of what do you see and how are you reading it and what in the frame is leading you to believe what your interpretation is but also can we tell what the intention of this is um and and see if if we can guess just by what the artist has included what they've intended from the images so um, we're going to go ahead and start off with, let me move some things around here over on my Photoshop world. We're going to go ahead and start the screen share this morning. So we have plenty of time to get through everything. And don't forget, if you are hanging out in the audience today, we want to hear from you. So we need your feedback. That's the whole point of going live with this stuff so that you guys get to participate as well and share your thoughts. So we're going to start with this image go ahead and uh oh set us all up here dang it <laughs> i'm competent i swear to god all right we're going to start with this image we want to look at it and just what do we see and that's kind of the first place that we're going to start so if you're in the audience today and you see this piece of art what do you see? And I don't want to qualify it any more than that. Whatever answer you give is, uh, is proper. Don't be afraid to put that in the comments as soon as you're ready. And the mods and co-hosts will be having a look at this to try to decide what they see as well. 
mods once you're ready just go ahead and raise your hand and i'll bring us back onto the screen all right what do you got matt um, I just see someone that's incredibly interesting. I want to get to know their story immediately and the, the nail polish and the rings and all the accessories and the beard, the eccentric beard. I want to know everything about this guy. So that's what I'm seeing. And I mean, it's just, it's the contrast, it's the darks, it's the light, it's everything that's just pulling me dead into his face. And I just want to know everything about this guy's story. Yeah. Yeah. A portrait. Oh, here. So uh, we got some comments today. So Crystal saying the subject to me demands attention. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think, yeah, that's great. Lizzie saying portrait of a man with distinctive style. I agree. That's my initial thought as well. I mean, aside from just the, the subject that is this man, um, the gaze it's like number one right here yeah. so intense like yeah there's all this interesting detail going on in the the wardrobe and the styling and everything but oh man right to the face of course to be reckoned with for sure you have the armor of all the jewelry as well as his gaze even the light being placed so far overhead that like all of his eyes are in shadow uh it just you know deepens that expression even more yeah and there's something, um, something in the in the pose and in the expression that just feels like he's surveying his realm, and you are part of it. <laughs> well, it's just the nonchalance of power, right? Like, what? <laughs> <laughs> there, there's what? this furrow in the brow here, though. I mean, is it is it really nonchalance, though? It seems pretty, I mean, everything about his position is just like, yes, and what? I would say the furrow is more age than it is like muscle. Mm, my great nemesis. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> <I'm talking about laughs> Kelly is with us this morning. Good morning, lovely Kelly. Kelly. So we've said already, we see this as a portrait. Like most of us have said this. What, what makes us believe that this is a portrait and not a jewelry campaign and not a something else? Why do we feel like this is a portrait? If you're in the audience today and you thought this was a portrait as well, why is this a portrait of this guy and not something else? I feel like if like if we're speaking about jewelry specifically, it would be a much tighter crop. You know, the focus and the light is on his face and his expression, not necessarily featuring anything else about him. Yeah. And I think um, it's styled in such a way that it's showing the jewelry is showing more about who he hit. Sorry let me start again the jewelry is is positioned to show more about who he is than him being positioned to show off the jewelry for somebody else like the feeling of it is this is more context clues for who this guy is as a person um than like here you want to buy this don't you i want that chair though <laughs> <laughs> go steal it from basam The environment's definitely giving me portrait also like we have of course this this intent of going to sit in a studio this is not something dynamic and environmental like this is a photo studio this person is here for the purpose of having their photo taken but yeah everything there in in like was just mentioned that focus on the face with the light and the contrast there takes it from what could possibly be editorial to definitely something that is about him as a person Right. So we're looking at, if you're just joining us this morning, we're looking at images today and using our visual literacy skills to try to learn about the subject and how the artist has treated the subject in these photographs. 
And in this case, we are saying that this is a portrait and then we are using these context clues related to the subject and how the subject relates to their environment, to the clothing they're wearing, to expressions and body language and all of that to try to figure out maybe what the intent is. And it's a portrait. So far, we've said the, the lighting has something to do with believing it's a portrait, the environment that they're in, a photo studio the way that they are posed and connected with the camera and the treatment of the image overall makes it feel like a portrait as opposed to something else like say an actor's headshot or a commercial image for the jewelry or, or something else along those lines. We're looking at all of these context clues related to the subject telling us we believe this is a portrait. So if you see this image and you are seeing different contexts or different you know clues that you think may make this image more likely to be something else and you have some you know some instincts to back that up based on what you're seeing in the image share that and see see if you can change our minds um if not and you're seeing the same thing are you seeing anything else in this image that might lead you to believe based on the treatment that this is not a portrait or it is a portrait of a person um and then we'll be able to hear from uh basam since this is his wonderful photograph and he'll be able to confirm or deny. <laughs> well, you're, you're all pretty much right on. It is definitely a portrait. It was intended as a portrait and designed and, and, and set up as a portrait. Uh, a little background story. I had a model friend of mine uh, message me and say, I have this friend of mine who models. He's always doing the same type of stuff. Uh, the dark, gothic, blood, uh, all kinds of really, really um, dark images if you look at his portfolio. And uh, she told me he'd like to, he likes your style and he'd like to do something completely different. Um, so the intent here was to do something different, but without losing the essence of who he is, right? And when I've met this guy for the first time, he's, he's the type of guy that when you look at his work and you look at his face and you look at his first impression, it's completely different than reality. He is the kindest, you know, he looks a bit rough and tough, but he's the kindest, most gentle person I've ever met, probably. All right. And the idea here is that to put him in a different environment than he usually is, have something completely different in terms of corporate than all the work that I've had access to on his social media, uh, kind of make put him, make him out of place, dress differently in a different environment, yet keep his essence and keep it within my style. And the approach there was to, if we were to make a portrait that he can blow up, print on canvas in a really large print and put it in a, you know, a nicely outfitted house, you know, put it up on a wall, what would it look like if, if that was the intent? Uh, so we put him in a suit, which he rarely wears. We put him in shoes that he rarely wears. Uh, I have these beautiful chairs, Kat, they really are amazing. Rich leather chair. Uh, and just had him sit there and we tried different poses and different angles and this kind of this image is probably the most uh, the one that had the most impact on me that i thought it was represented most what we wanted to do uh, you can still get that impression who he is but he kind of feels a bit out of place and for him it's something completely 180 degrees from anything he's ever done it was a success and uh there we are. Yeah. So um, I'm assuming then that, so you said he rarely ever wears a suit, but this is his suit? It's his suit. Okay. Right? It's, it's his suit. Uh, but if you look at all his portraits and all his work, it's, it's very far from that. Sure. Well, and I, the reason I asked um, is because when I look at this, I'm thinking, like look at the shirt that is included in the suit and yes. look at some of the detailing in the suit itself, right? Yes. Like some oh, of the detailing yeah, here. Exactly. Yeah, this is not, I, I had this in my studio and it happened to fit this guy, right? Like the style of the suit also very much fits him, which kind of makes it even clearer to me. I think that, you know, yes. this is about him. This is not about what you thought about him per se. Like. I didn't decide to style this person and based on what I believed of them, this is very Not much. We yeah. actually had no discuss discussion about styling in advance. We did with what he brought with him, right? And uh, and so it's just taking him and, and doing it in my style, my studio, my background, my type of portrait. 
and uh, yet with this dark and dark kind of moody lighting that would go well on a canvas in a in a large in, in a large print right and is this guy a thoughtful person yes he is very much i would assume very that much. as well like looking at the the facial expression and the pose like you know this is very much a, a thinker's like <laughs> a thinker's pose you know um which which i think communicates that really well also yeah He's very, he's a good communicator, very articulate. Uh, he's an artist, so it, there's, a, there's, a, there's a lot of depth to him, many layers to him. And you can see a lot of them in just his, 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 what he's putting on, his, his rings, his beard, his hair. It's a, everything is interesting about this guy. Yeah. Yeah, I think I'm communicated beautifully through the choices. So if anybody has um, anything else they want to kind of look at from a subject perspective that you think we've missed or you want to make sure that we talk about uh, before we switch out and look at another image where we can try to make some more guesses, uh, now is the time to throw that in there. From a visual literacy perspective, what else, is there anything else we need to see? I, I struggled with the not struggle, but uh, with the crop, right? Because I have a, a very diff, I have a very similar pose, but with the whole, you know, you know, backed off wide angle, where you can see that chair, the, the the foot, the other foot on the on the floor, and I just didn't think it brought us close enough to him, right? It was mm. just another person sitting on a chair rather than the than the details you can see with this close up and and uh, the emphasis on his on the rings on his left hand and so on, which didn't really pop in the other photo even though it was a very similar image very similar pose i was thinking about that crop too basam um because i mean it's, it's kind of breaking some rules right with cutting off that lower foot and uh i, th I think it, i think it works and i mean even just compositionally it's it's got that nice kind of flow to it uh from the right hand side um and it hits all those kind of generalistic sort of uh, compositional rules. You know, you're within various thirds of the image. You're using the negative space pretty well. So I think it actually does work to crop in like that. He oh, has the he has a kind of golden ratio shape, doesn't he? Yes, yes. That uh, where the face is is right where you'd get the center of that yeah. spiral, right there on the left eye. I like the overall composition, but I do wish that the camera was just over to the right, just a tiny bit more um with like <clears throat> broad around um but that's just i feel like his knee is kind of cropping off uh block well not cropping but blocking off a lot of his body uh and that just moving ever so slightly you know camera right would really give you just a little bit more more of his chest you mean and his uh yeah yeah uh, i believe I, I have another photo of that angle but anyways yeah yeah, his expression and just the way he's holding his hands, like everything else, take it out of the equation. His expression and his hands are like, like a perfect juxtaposition. Yeah. Yeah, agreed. All right. So let's go ahead and continue on. And we'll look at a, a couple more that are going to be interesting because they, well, I'll let them speak for themselves. Um, so let's go here. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and drop us off. Take a look at this image. And what do you see? Go ahead and put that in the comments. We'll bring those comments up. We will discuss them and also share what we see. And then we'll see if we can use those visual context clues to try to figure out or explain why we believe that to be true about the subject matter. I'll go ahead and do a Zoom for us as well. If you are in the audience today, go ahead and put your comments in the chat. What do you see? Oops. All right, what do we got? 
I see exhaustion, but determination. I see a desert and uh, I see a woman that's consumed by that environment. That's what I see. Now I see, is it the war shark test? Like. <laughs> It actually, Sorry, I'm managing like, stuff back here. <laughs> it, it actually feels like she's been through hell and actually has a minute to breathe. Yeah, there's a peacefulness mm -hmm. to her, like a thoughtfulness. So but a woman that has a the blood and gore and dust. Yeah, it's somebody that has a story to tell that I want to just sit next to and listen to. Whoops. Um, if you're in the audience today, let us know. That's the whole point of doing these things live so we can chat back and forth. So what do you guys see and why do you see it? So we've had a few initial thoughts on there. If we're looking at this, if we're going to, you know, kind of break these things down from a visual literacy perspective, what kind of assumptions or guesses can we make and why? Like, what are the visual cues that are are leading us into, you know, you said she, you know, looked like they've been through hell, right? So, so what, what clues us into those things? I mean, a blood. We got some. Yeah, she's beating the hell up. We got some scratches on the arms. We got dirt on those hands. Tattering of her clothing. The tattering of the clothing and the clothing too. I mean, it's very stylistically dystopian. Um, I mean, just relating to the way like that kind of post-apocalyptic sci-fi sort of vibe is displayed in the media. Um, so, I mean, it's definitely tapping in to that representation of what if on another planet or in the future or after the world ends kind of styles. Um, and so that's, that's what it's giving us, especially in this desert environment, right? It's like, this is someone out of place, away from human society, using these, you know, pop culture kind of driven stylistic cues and here's some delicious blood and gore on top to add to that narrative. I love stylistic blood and gore. <laughs> Give me people who are dirty and have scars on their knuckles. Yeah, I think it's really important too. So we talked before um, and you know, as Becca mentioned, like there's the kind of visual throwbacks to the, the pop culture ideas of, you know, post-apocalyptic type styles, right? And you'll see these in, in many different kinds of post-apocalyptic post media where people either have worn something until it cannot be worn anymore. And then after it can't be worn anymore, they still have to figure out some way to use it because you've got to use what you can. So maybe you wrap it around your arms, right? Or maybe you, you protect your hands or who knows, but these these kind of pieces of obviously, like Kat was saying, like they've been worn to hell. They've been worn till they're till they're broken and falling apart. Um, and, and that obviously speaks a lot to if that's how long she's either worn these things or have found them in this condition, she's clearly not, you know, hanging out on the outskirts of LA in the 20th century, <laughs> like, unless she's going to maybe Burning Man or something, right? Like that, that, that can be a whole thing. We could, we could make a guess about that, but there's no additional environmental context that would lead us to believe that, that that's the case. There's nothing you know, modern or of this time that you would look at and go, ah, it's, it's anachronistic and here's why. And it's so it's, lend itself to, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, go, go, go. Oh, just, just when looking at, or I mean, even designing, you know, from the art perspective, like how to make sure that it's feeling futuristic, like we're, we're leaning to these like early kind of human wardrobe choices like the you know the cowl and the cloak and the wraps and this general protection from the elements of, but i mean her leggings are so modern and it works because then it's like oh this is clearly something later than now so important touches for sci-fi sorry nicole i didn't mean to scare you away
Yeah, um, I, I like the, the simplicity of the background. If you look, I mean, it's a very tight crop, and yet just that hint of sand tells, you know, helps tell the story, even though it's just a plain background, right? Um, like, the story is not just in, in the subject herself, it's also in that simple background. 100%. Yeah. Sorry, I had to drop off for just a sec. Um, yeah, so if we, you know, in the last image, it felt very clear to us that that was a portrait. What would we guess is the intent of the artist then in this shot? Are we still looking at a portrait? Or are we looking at something else? It's still giving portrait. It's like documentary voyeuristic to me. Um, I don't see it as a portrait. I see it as a, a captured moment where she didn't know the photographer was there. That's the feel that I get. OK, yeah. question, question for you. Does a portrait subject need to be aware of the image for it to be a portrait? Oh, it's a good question. I just meant it wasn't like a posed portrait. Yeah. That's all I meant by that. But no, I agree with you. It does not have to be like a formal portrait to be a portrait. Not so if we were to. I actually want to address Becca's question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I don't think so. Uh, because a portrait is a visual representation that tells a story of who someone is. And that doesn't require their awareness of the documentation. Yeah. If we're to crop it this way, does it make a difference? Not to me. No. Well, now I'm going to be angry that you cut off her fingertips. Yeah. <laughs> so the reason I the reason I did this really quickly, I just want to see this is a cinematic crop. This is kind of the the average aspect ratio now for when we for when we you know like watch movies and TV and things like that. Um, and so if if we were to crop it this way, or I mean I can even I can you know go back and do a sixteen by nine in a way that keeps her fingertips in there. But the question is, you know, does this now look like a still from a film, right? Like, and if it, if it were to be something like a still from a film, is it still a portrait? Yes. Explain. So the subject matter is the defining element that makes it a portrait or not. I don't feel that the crop is necessary to that definition at all. Let me grab because now I'm curious, because I think this is really interesting. I don't actually have this to pull up right now, but there are, this is just one of obviously of several um, images, but I'm gonna pull this over here. Same subject matter, different treatment. Is this a portrait? Yes. Okay, Matt says yes. Why? Well, I think for some of the things that we were just talking about, right? It's a it's telling a story about an individual without them necessarily knowing they're being photographed, and I think it shows that person and their story and their personality amidst an environment. Um, yeah, I think it's a it's a portrait. Sure. The, the argument can certainly be made for it to be a portrait, but I would say the primary subject of this image is not the man, but the space, the environment. I, I, that I think the definition of portrait is so, so large and wide that I think we're, we're, we're focusing on the wrong thing. I, I, I think the intent of the artist is more important than whether we think it's a portrait or not. If you, when you, when you did the artist intend it as a portrait or did the in, 
it did the artist intended as a storytelling series of I think that that brings in the whole question of death of the artist as well, um, as we relate it to imagery and art in general, and how much the artist intent actually matters when we begin like engaging with the piece. Because um, we're going to look at a couple images in a minute where we can't ask the artist anymore, although we do have some extant sources that tell us what these things are for. When we look at those pieces, most of us don't have that background knowledge. And so we're engaging with them without artist intent. The only cues we have to artist intent are what's in the frame. And so I think that that's kind of um, an interesting part of this question of visual literacy when we're looking at imagery like this is to see what we what can we glean you know like when we when we look at this from that perspective um what can we glean purely just by what's in the frame would, are, there, would there be a difference if if this was a film and that was a still from the from the film would there be a difference with a still from the film itself versus say, them taking whoever's producing the, the film taking portraits of her and posing her that way for a portrait for the film. Would there be a difference? I don't that's know. An interesting, that's an interesting question, Bassam. It would look exactly the same. One of the still from the film and the other one is posed for a promotional whatever. That's an interesting question. Um, Lindsay sharing, I disagree that the intent of the artist is most important. Art, once it's released, takes on a life of its own which is, you know, the, the question of death of the author, like at, at what point does that removal come into place? And which is why when we discuss these things and we talk about also things like how we release images and then also things like naming the images and if that's included and where it's at, um, because once, once the art goes out into the world, the only thing that it has to speak for it is the piece itself, right? And what's included. Yeah, and Lindsay, I totally agree with you. When I, when I said it, I meant, whether it was intentional, intended as a portrait or not, right, may make a difference. I, I totally agree that it takes a life of its own after and we can interpret it any way we want. Uh, but I, I can't see somebody saying, okay, let's take a portrait of you or let's put some blood on you and let's do that and let's do that, unless there's a story behind it and a, and a, and a, and a, Maybe because I'm skewed by the fact that I know that this is a series that you did as opposed to just a portrait of a person. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, Becca, what do you think? Is this is this still a portrait? If this is a portrait, is this a portrait? Did Becca freeze? She hasn't blinked in a long time. Is she disassociating? <laughs> she, she's gone. Okay. So the really the reason that I was asking is because I think, you know, when we're talking about visual literacy in the subject matter, um, there's there's so many different clues that we're looking at when we try to distinguish something like, um, what is this for, right? Like, is this a still from a film? Is this a portrait? Is this, what is this? Um, and when we're looking at a shot like this, we mentioned a lot of things that could lead us to believe that maybe this could be a portrait, right, from the intention of the crop um, and things like that. But both images have a very similar treatment. They're both desaturated. The subject is not looking at the camera. Um, there's no purposeful engagement between the subject and the viewer, except that you mentioned earlier, which I think I, I agree with, that there's a voyeuristic quality, right? The purpose is not to say, here, look at this person looking at you. Who are they? The point is to say, what's going, like, who is this person? What's going on with them? And in this shot, I think when we have so much additional context, environmental context, um, there, the clothing is more visible in this context as well. And then we have the added, you know, these spaceships or whatever they are in the scene. Um, then I think it becomes of course, the individual is important, but I think at least for me, the story comes into play more. And then the question is, how does this individual relate to the story that we're seeing? And and what is it about that that tells us more about the person rather than just like as in with your with your wonderful portrait, Bassam, everything was telling us about the man. Right. Um, and even though all of this give context to the person, now all of a the sudden there's something I feel like greater beyond the person that becomes um part of the 
Yeah, th there is. It's definitely greater than the person, but I see this image more of a portrait than the other one. Mm, and the reason I see that is because it's it looks posed, right? It looks, let's pose in the environment that you're usually in. Like, yes, it is about the story, but it's also, it, 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 it's, let's take a portrait of you in your environment, as opposed to the other one, which is more of a, it's almost like she's not aware that you're taking the picture. Whereas this one looks like the, the, the subject is engaged in the, in taking the image. Interesting. So we lost you for a minute there, Becca. Do we have you back safely? Okay. Yeah, so, so I don't my computer crashed. Oh no, that's junky. I know I was looking at you and I'm like, she hasn't blinked in a long time. <laughs> <laughs> She's being super still. Um, so from, if you were to answer that question, so we just chatted about that. So if, if we were to say that this is a portrait, then um, is this a portrait? I'm conflicted. So you, I lost, my brain uh, right about where Basam mentioned, you know, what if this was an actual still from the movie uh, or something, you know, that was captured um, mm. from the film versus something that was then created afterwards. And there is, I feel like this, this moment of intent. So if this was actually in a film, um, I feel like the focus here is really not so much on the character, but yes, this pose is, it feels very posed. It does not feel like a candid moment that's captured. Um, but imagine if she was actually just naturally walking here, we have more of this kind of establishment of space and moment, especially with those spaceships, right? Like this is kind of the defining characteristic of this story itself that's captured in the frame is we have this, I don't know if it's an invasion, if it's warriors going off to war, I don't know what it is, but there's something happening with these spaceships above the character. And I feel like that is truly the most important part of the singular moment in time. It isn't necessarily the walking of the character. It is whatever is happening and about to happen with these spaceships. Um, so I think that takes away a little bit from the aspect of it being a portrait, um, but given the nature of, but like like the way that it's technically composed, like the depth of field, um, you know, the, the posture, the posing of the, the subject itself does lead it to feel like it wants to be a portrait. And I suppose maybe the question is, was this maybe the best approach either to creating a portrait or to creating something more narrative? If it kind of falls in the middle. I had to put my glasses on because when we first started looking at this image, I was like, those are some weird clouds. <laughs> Very dark. They're very dark <laughs> and evenly spaced. <laughs> yeah. And that's, that's a, a, a legitimate question, right? Like, so in, and that would lead without additional context of if this were, let's say to be from a movie, right? right without the additional context of what comes before or after, because you could absolutely shoot a scene like this with a shallow depth of field, but you would assume that if you were to do that, if this was like a narrative piece where the ships are going, then the important thing is about how she feels about what's happening. Not necessarily that there are ships, right? But the fact that she is there with these ships in a situation. And what does that mean? If we were to, extend this depth of field out all the way, then it may it may narratively and visually mean less about the fact that she is involved, but the fact that this is happening, right? And so um, I'm glad that you brought that up, Becca, because that's a, a legitimate question that we have to ask ourselves when we're reading an image visually. All of these things are choices that the artist is making. So how does depth of field come into play if we're looking at something like this from a narrative perspective, as opposed to something like this, where we still have a, we actually have a similar depth of field here, but we have a whole lot less context. And so obviously the, the cue is still entirely on her. Um, and this is a much more intimate moment than the other images. And I think we do tend to also want to read intimate moments as if they are purposeful and meant for the viewer as opposed to those grander moments which seem more meant for the story so if we, if we were to take this exact pose right here and we apply it to the second image i think that that would make that a more introspective intimate moment with that character 
and lend it itself more towards portraiture than the in-between space. Interesting. Okay, we have to keep moving, but I'm 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 really I'm super super interested in in the things that we've covered so far and how if you notice what we've been talking about, we're looking at the person, we're looking at their pose, their expression, what they're wearing, how the things that they're wearing relate to their environment. And that all goes back to the choices that we make as an artist when it comes to the subject matter that we're dealing with and the person, the subject themselves that we're dealing with and how we treat them. Um, so whoop. Um, we're gonna look at these just really quickly as a kind of antithesis to what we just saw in the fact that this still has this this has a 16 by 9 crop right which there's a purpose for that when you leave something in a 4 by 6 frame which is the natural aspect ratio that you get from a digital camera there's a difference in read between that and when you choose a different crop like if you were to crop the square and this was looking looking like an instagram you know post like there's differences that we can read in those things but also in the subject matter themselves and how we're treated and if you're to look at the difference between this one and the last one, obviously, stylistically, the subject matter is treated very different. And that leads us to believe different things about this person. So if we were to go quickly and you were to just rapid fire your thoughts. What a babe. <laughs> I think this actually works really well as a follow up to that previous photograph, uh, the the wider photograph, even in this 16 by nine aspect ratio, because this also has this element of environment and detailed narrative environment within it. But our focus still is immediately to the face and to the details of the face and the light and it like every visual cue from the color to the lighting to to the value is leading us right to that face. So we still get the overall vibe of that environment as if we're walking down the street, we know where we are, we kind of get a feeling of what's going on. There's rain, there's lights, we, you know, we're in a city, but everything wants to look right in the face. And that brings it towards portraiture. Yeah. Anybody else have any kind of thoughts before we get to some of the kind of classics and see what we can determine from those? I want to be like nice trigger discipline. Um, but, <laughs> yeah, my just, military training coming, coming back. There it is. There it is. Um, but no, I, I love those pops of color that bring you right into the eye, right? Instead of looking at the moon in the background or whatever that is, that, that bright pink just brings you, like Becca was saying, directly into the face. And I love, I absolutely love that little bit of pop, you know, even more so than what's on the cheek. Love that it draws you right in. So we can obviously infer things by clothing, by by um, the, the style is going, the hood is up, the rain is falling. Like there's lots of things we can infer. There's clearly been some kind of damage that has happened and that tells you even a little bit more about this character. This is not entirely a human, right? Maybe, maybe they're partially human or maybe they're entirely a cyborg. We, we can't tell. Um, but the the treatment and the the lighting, all of those things, like it's all about the subject. And so that gives you a lot of story there that you get to pull from. And then we're gonna look at, let me go ahead and we were gonna use this one cause there's lots of small things um, in here that are included purposely, but we don't have a whole lot of time. So a few images that most of us will probably be familiar with, American Gothic being one of them, portrait of a lady, this is John Singer Sargent. And then, of course, Vermeer's Girl with a Pearl Earring. And out of all of these, I believe we know most about these two and least about her. Um, so if we are to read American Gothic for, for folks who have kind of no idea what's going on here, there's a lot that we can infer. And I would love to get, if, if people have initial thoughts here, what do you see? Like, what is happening here? And, and what can we tell about these people by the way that they're treated? If you're in the audience today, put your thoughts in the chat. Come on, guys. We need you. We need your feedback.
this made me cackle a little bit on the inside. <laughs> So, I mean, there's immediately this implication of husband and wife. Like, and I feel like, I, I don't think anyone would really disagree with that. Tell me if you disagree, because I, given that it's in front of this house, it's a couple, they look somewhat maybe kind of close in age, though the woman definitely looks a little bit younger. And it evokes that sense of homestead mm -hmm. immediately, both in relationship and space. Yeah. And in style, she's not like neither of them are are wearing something that would make you believe that one is of a different class, right? They look like they're coming right out of the same yep. place. Totally, I love the fact that he is wearing a suit coat over his overalls, like that. That I think that that this says this says to me this is a man who works on a farm, not just a man who lives on a farm and profits off the proceeds of the farm but he is he knows he's having his portrait made right like this this is not you don't just put this on because you're gonna go out and like shovel chicken poop right like her outfit's very interesting too the longer i stare at it so this our friend in facebook land saying long unhappy marriage can't smile anymore mm. interesting doesn't have to be unhappy, just long. Yeah, it, like, I, it, it doesn't necessarily seem unhappy either. Yeah, but very serious. I mean, I don't know if anyone anyone else out there is, you know, family from the Midwest or from the Midwest and like farm folk. And I mean, that feels like, you know, all those like old school style marriages to me from like distant relatives. I think there's also a big deep a good hint of relative status in a typical American family at that point. I mean, look at what he's, he's the head of the family. It's obvious. Look at the way he's grabbing. He's in the front. She's behind them, kind of looking at him. He's actually more on display than she is. And the way he's grabbing that fish fork, like it's really tight. It's like, I'm in charge. I'm it. I think that's a really great observation. I love that you mentioned that he's in front of her as well, which obviously is a very purposeful choice. The fact that they're in front of their home there. Um, and and for her wardrobe choice, um, I'm glad that you mentioned that as well, Becca, because, and if you notice, she has a little tendril of hair hanging down also. Um, and you can tell, so he's wearing his work clothes with a jacket over the top. She is wearing a home dress with an apron over the top, which is what you did to protect your clothing, right? You would put over, you would wear, you'd had some kind of apron that you generally had your daily wear, right? But that also transferred to um, what you wore in general. So if, if somebody was going to come over, um, you know, all of these, all of these things that they're very, and she has, she's got on her, her, her um, cameo, her brooch, her cameo as well. And all of those things really speak to like, we're, we're going to be seeing people, right? Like this isn't, we just came off of doing things. We're going to be seeing people. Um, so also saying she has her good apron on, right? So you have these, these clothing context clues um, as well. I'm curious what you guys think about her expression. I feel so looking at this from a modern perspective, this feels to me like the artist was like, come on. Like, I, I, we got to do this real quick. And they're like, freaking fine. <laughs> <laughs> like here, we're going to, this is what my parents would do if I was like, I want to take your portrait. And they're like, ah. <laughs> well, the story, the story I build around it is that he was actually working in the field. She's the one that organized all this. She's all ready for it. And then she says, honey, can you please just come in for the more portrait? And can you throw on, can you throw on a jacket, please? So that you look at least half decent. So he's kind of upset and she's looking at him saying, like you can see her frustration with him trying to get him to come into the portrait to take the picture or to paint the portrait or whatever. And and the jacket was kind of an afterthought, like, can you just look a little more respectable, please? So what that's, you're saying is it's a typical dynamic? <laughs> yeah, that's the story I build around it, right? It's amazing how much like, because this reads like so modern family portrait to me too, mm -hmm. like a hundred years after it was painted. <laughs> Right. How strange and, is humanity? <laughs> so, um, and I'll share just a, a couple of things really quickly because I want to at least look at one more thing before we drop off today. But 
the the fun thing here and people people mentioned this subtly so this is a farmer and his daughter and and they are relatively close in age like obviously within 20 years or so but one of the clues i think that we have there aside from the fact that they're not standing side by side so there's not equality of relationship here right like she is clearly behind him um she's she's younger than he is but we notice the lines on her face i think which probably also make us kind of go like okay maybe that's his wife this is a hard life right like this ages you quickly um this is not this is not a a life where you get to maintain your youth and your looks for a long time um facebook friend saying she's looking at him as the leader of this but also like she's saying just do it and then you can go back to the barn and yeah, I mean, that's that's the feeling we get. And so, um, you know, having looked at this and, and read a few things into it, um, basically, so Grant Wood is the, the painter of this image. And he said that he wanted to paint this in a way that explored or evoked an earlier generation um, as if they were like tintypes from an old family album. So we get a lot of those clues there from the very stiff posing, which was required for photographs at that time. And also because um, people didn't, they, they felt like smiling was um, kind of ridiculous in a, in a portrait, right? It was like over the top emotionally. And so there were there are a lot of context clues there that then once we understand, we, we get to read into the image, which is really cool. So, I'm so interested that that's the daughter. Yeah. Because it feels so wifely. And, and this is like probably because she is she is probably an unmarried spinster. Sure. Yeah. Right. Which she's going to be more staid and more like, you know. So interesting. Um, so we don't have a whole lot of time, so um, I'm going to just kind of share a couple of things here. Interestingly enough. So this is John Singer Sargent. This is one of my favorite portraits. There's so much we can immediately tell about the subject. But if we didn't know those things and we were to photograph this in a modern day, we would not naturally assume that this is a woman of power and prestige. We, we could assume that she went to Bassam's studio and picked out one of the dresses that she has and, and took a, you know, because she wanted a beautiful portrait of herself. But during this time period, that was not a thing that, could happen. You did not take a char woman and put her in a fancy gown and believe that she could be a, a lady of, you know, high station. This was a very wealthy socialite wearing the clothes that she would have owned. But it's also very intentionally a portrait. All the context clues from pose and location, right? tell you that this is a portrait. And interestingly enough, this was originally painted with this strap down here, which caused a big controversy and um, nearly ruined the lives of both artist and subject. Um, he had to go and repaint this to try to regain <laughs> some of his like reputation. But it's very much styled very much purposeful, but also really speaks to who she is and her station in life. Was he banned from Facebook for that? <laughs> <laughs> he would have been. If Facebook would have been around, they would have been like, nope, not for you, sir. Which is so interesting to me. Um, and then, and we also, we know this because obviously this is relatively contemporary. So we know about the history of the artist and this woman, you can go and look up all the information on them. So we get to know these things, right? But we don't have a whole lot of information about this, this famous portrait. Oh, but people love to theorize. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, there's whole movies, right? Oh my goodness. That was so because this is such an interesting one, I just want to give us a, a, a chance to, to theorize on our own. Knowing this is by Vermeer gives some additional context for me to understand this image, knowing how he purposefully posed and set people up to paint them and did style them for painting them, not to tell who they are, but to tell stories, right? Like, it's not like he didn't do portraits because he did portraits, 
but he often would do these slice of life paintings where the the purpose was not here's a portrait of this particular person but here is a woman doing a woman's work or whatever um and so i think that makes this particular shot really interesting because was this a portrait or was this styled to photo or to to, to paint to photograph to, to make it a thing right there's so much just in it itself even without that additional context Oops. that lands it in that kind of beautifully intimate middle ground like this this could be maybe a candid photograph mm -hmm. or it could be taken in the studio obviously either way or painted or whatever just the the expression in the face the eye contact that very direct i am aware of you i see you eye contact but then there's the softness to the face right she's her mouth is a little open it's almost like she's she's just caught you right and she's looking back it is the eye contact is is there really eye contact with the with the painter because it looks like she's looking slightly it's as if she's coy or shy and hasn't doesn't want to look at that extra millimeter up mm. she's looking down a little bit is what i see anyways in either way she sees you yeah, no she is she, yeah, she absolutely. is aware of the viewer right yeah 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 so Lindsay saying paintings are interesting because they are always intentional unlike photos where there can be happy accidents which is absolutely true everything that goes into a painting is very purposefully put there by the artist but so is the intent. Is it all contrived? Or was it trying to capture this accidental discovery moment of looking over the shoulder is the question. But even if it was, you have to have her pose long enough to do it. Sure, right? yeah. Like, yeah, I mean, even beautiful if, regardless, like it's, it's, it has it's, to be contrived either way. If, even if you're trying to say, let's try to capture a moment that doesn't feel contrived, you have to contrive it in order to make looking, it that way. If you're going to paint it. Looking at the intent, right? What is the feeling that they wanted to capture and then evoke through the painting? So I think what's really the most interesting for me about this particular image is that if you were not, if you were to know nothing about Vermeer, if you were just to walk across this painting somewhere, having never seen it before, you would probably assume based on history that this was a wealthy woman, right? She's wearing a, she's wearing some kind of silk. This is not a wool dressing robe or something, right? She's wearing a turban. She has a great big pearl earring going on. Um, like you, you could make that assumption without the additional context of knowing anything about the artist and the fact that people could come and get dressed <laughs> like you could dress people up and put them up to pose for you so that you could paint them in in you know whatever way that you wanted to you you would probably make that assumption and is that important like the fact that you may be wrong about that does it actually matter because is the intent still to make this to, to make the viewer believe that this is a wealthy person without that context. Um, and Lindsay saying, Degas was in, famous for uninten intentional unintention, right? Like that's that's one of those things there. So super, super interesting stuff. Well, maybe I'm, I'm too simple and ignorant about this, but I, I don't see all the controversy. I mean, it's just a portrait, pose for me, I'll paint you. I don't see anything like I think we're we're having fun with this, taking it in all kinds of directions, right? And I just see it as that's definitely a portrait. Pose for me, look over your shoulder. I'm gonna paint you. That, that's how I see it. Sorry. Well, that's where the context comes into play. Yeah, right. As a right, photograph right. today. No. Yeah, problem. as a photograph. That, yeah, it would no be no problem. Exactly that. But so why wouldn't it be back then? Because of who who was sitting for portraits. And a lot of Paris. that's very well documented. I mean, particularly in this period of time where art was starting to move away, like from the church, right? So like 
that was when the the public or rather you know in private people are starting to commission paintings of themselves um particularly you know in this like kind of dutch master sort of era they were painting portraits of the wealthy uh, because they wanted yeah, to show off sure. their status and so when something like this is not documented we don't know who it is it's immediately you know interesting to historians that they don't have that documentation for whoever the socialite or wealthy merchant or whoever it is is also what is controversial about this painting like similar to american gothic right where they have this kind of stoicism to them even though it's much much later in history this is not a stoic portrait her lips are parted she's making this this contact with the viewer, with the painter, with her eyes. There's, again, that kind of sense of intimacy that was not appropriate in portraiture at that time. No, and there's a sensuality as well. Yes, um, sensuality. There's, yeah, there's a sensuality to her expression that was not something that you saw, um, particularly during that time as well. And um, so, Lindsay, also echoing what you said, Becca, um, portraits previously were only for the wealthy. Nobody knew who this girl is, which is, of course, why, if, you know, people have conjectured, oh, she was a maid in the house. And then they, they continue to read into that even farther and saying, well, the way that she's looking at him, he was probably having an affair with her. Right. And so they, they conjectured all kinds of things about who this person could be because this is such a unique portrait um, for the time period. And also, um, as, as we began moving away from the subject matter being either wealthy people, religious figures, or historical or myth mythological figures, right? We started to see regular people also during this time period, like those slice of life things. Um, and so it, this was just a really kind of turbulent period anyway in art history and where, where things were starting to move. So um, when we have all that context, that makes this this picture even more interesting. But if we were to remove all of that context and look at it just as you were saying, Bassam, like this is just a portrait of a person, right? Um, then we have only what we can see in the frame to read from. And that's why we're having this whole conversation in the first point or first place about visual literacy, because what will live beyond our you know, historical records or context that people might have is what the artist chose to include. And that's where artist intent lives. So we can go find out what we want from history, but artist intent ends with the canvas. And that's all we have to judge by. When if we don't painted? have that additional comment. Jan Vermeer, J-A-N is the when, first when, name. Sorry, when? Oh, um, God. Approximately. I don't know the year off the top of my head. Hang on just a second. Um... I, I kind of regret not, you know, the the a great art, great art explained on YouTube. Fifteen minutes. I I saw that. Sixteen sixty five. Sixteen sixty five. I I didn't watch this uh, this episode. But oh cool. man, you gotta watch that too. It's there. I haven't yeah. watched it either. It's there. I just... It's there. Okay, I gotta watch that as well. I haven't watched that one yet. Um, I just I whatever I know about the, this is from looking from the Scarlett Johansson movie. I did not watch <laughs> that one. I know of it. I didn't watch it. All right, y'all. So we have already kind of exceeded our hour today, and it is time to start shutting it down. Um, any final thoughts from? <laughs> I, I'm just laughing because I have a, I have a, I have an image that I took that kind of similar to that in terms of how how the subject was looking back at the photographer, and it just reminded me. We don't have to go through it now. We just, I just snicker about it, but I'll, I'll send it to you just for. Fun. Yeah. <laughs> um. Any final thoughts y'all want to share or to, to kind of leave people with on how subject, how the subject is treated in an image or a piece of art? Final thoughts. Jeez. Yes and no. No final thoughts, just continuous thoughts. <laughs> Let's just keep going and rambling for the next three hours. Um, I, I, I very much appreciated uh, your photographs that you shared in the beginning. Um, I feel like that was a great look at like the variety of ways that you can approach that exploration of character and subject. Um, and I hope everyone who looked at them can look at that variety and apply it to yourself and just how to use similar tools, but use them differently. And you create these wildly different stories within them. Um, and, I, and I mean, that's the joy of making art, right? Is you have a select group of things that you can use and how do you go ahead and how do you use them to the best of your ability? Yeah. 
And and I think that that's kind of part of what makes this so cool is in every case we have we have our tools that you mentioned right we have contrast and we have um, environment and we have clothing and we have expression and we have body language we have all those things and then how do we utilize them to say whatever it is that we want to say either about the subject themselves or about how the subject can help us tell the story that we want to tell. And if the story that you're telling is about what might people be like in a post-apocalyptic world, you need a character to help you tell that story, how you decide to style them, how you decide, like I, I could have very easily put her in clean white robes and turned her into a desert shaman as opposed to put her in torn up, rugged, you know, beat up things and put dirt and blood on her knuckles and on her arms to, to show the struggle of whatever she's going through. Those are artistic choices, right? And so we all have the same tools. How we use them is, is and then how that is read by the viewer is obviously like the key to being able to do all of this. Any final thoughts from you, Bassam? Not really. No, that, that no. All righty. So thanks everybody for being here this morning with loving hearing your thoughts um, and, and seeing your comments. Remember, that's why we are doing this live, not only so we have these visuals so we can kind of talk through them and explore that visual literacy aspect in real time, but also so we can hear your thoughts and get to hang out with you. That's what makes, all, you know, doing all of this worthwhile. So we will be continuing visual literacy next week, Mondays and Fridays, we will be together, but also next Thursday is the second Thursday of the month. That means that we will be getting together to do all of this again, um, being doing our Thursday live. So come hang out with us on Thursday also at 7 p.m. Mountain Standard Time, but we'll be together on Monday and Friday at 7 a.m. Mountain Standard Time. That's 6 a.m. for the West Coast and 9 a.m. for the East Coast afternoon for our friends overseas. Come learn to think like an artist and dive into visual literacy with us. Once the visual literacy section is over, we will be dropping back to just Thursdays again for a while. Um, there's a whole lot going on, so we have to kind of manage that, but we are getting a lot more active in our Facebook group. So if you are in there, really encourage you come in there, share your work, share your thoughts, come explore how to be an artist with us. And until Monday morning, we will see everybody then have a fantastic weekend. Go make something amazing, relax, have fun, do all the stuff. And we'll see everybody then. Bye. Bye.